I told him, I was like, my ultimate goal is to open my own. And then he just hit me and had this kind of moment where we really had this very almost difficult conversation. And I, you know, I'm still so thankful for him for that, that day, which it was a very difficult situation because I was just kind of nestling into operating this restaurant again, just back into my comfort zone of just operating this restaurant. And he was like, look, are you good? Do you want to open your own place or not? Hey, you're listening to the Friends in Austin podcast. I'm your host, Justin Talent. And every week I bring you the stories of the people of Austin. Thank you for listening. So how long have you been in Austin? 17 years now. 17 years? Yeah, 17 years now. Yeah, I got here in 2004-ish, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 2004. Yeah. How did you get into the restaurant industry? And was Swift Static your first at restaurant? Yeah, so I started in college. I mean, my my rise to hospitality, I guess it was, was very kind of convoluted. I, I went to Texas A&M to try to be a vet. Um, you know, I kind of grew up in that family which it was like you can be anything you want as long as it's a doctor lawyer or you know engineer kind of as thing as you know, very yeah. prestigious. <laughs> yeah. and then and i was like oh you know what it's like i love animals let's do that and i had i i held that dream on probably since i was like seven eight years old or something and i just kind of ran with it went all the way to a&m um you know went to biomedical science as a major and you know, went all the way through the first two years of that and then thought it was probably a good idea to to go work at a vet clinic to see if I even like it, you know, and then I did and I, I kind of hated it. It wasn't kind of what I imagined. I think if I had a, a better guidance counselor, they might've probably pointed me more towards zoology or some sort of like a zookeeper or something. <laughs> like I think it just, you know, I think it was, it, it was very, you know, to pardon phrase, it was kind of, um, it was, it was more of a service based kind of the one, at least the clinic that I was at, it felt like it was um, a lot of the, people that were bringing in their animals it was like they had these animals were better off if they were in the wild mm. <laughs> like you know what i mean it was I, kind of like it wasn't i don't know it was a little bit more of a it was a just different type of neighborhood it just wasn't i don't know it just it didn't it didn't vibe with what i was thinking i think it was it was a lot of you know shots and neuters and spays which is obviously kind of bread and butter of a lot of kind of domesticated animals and you know whatever so from there um I was doing a lot of children's summer camps and I had a part of the big brother, big sisters program and, you know, a lot of mentorship type of things like that, just cause that's always just been part of my, you know, my drive. I grew up kind of in the hood and, and from, you know, kind of a broken family growing up. And so I always had a soft spot for that kind of stuff. And, you know, I thought I was like, well, let me, you know, maybe I have a knack for this. And, and I kind of like kind of a jack of all trades, master of none type of thing, you know, it was like to, to, it, I think people in, like I, we were talking before, I was like, I play a little guitar. Not enough to do it professionally, but to a three, uh, to a third grader, it's pretty amazing, you know. And I was like, oh, I pick up a bass, I can play some bass. And it's like, maybe not to play in a band, but or I played in a symphony or whatever it was. But to a third grader, it's like, man, is there anything you know, like this kid, this guy couldn't do this kind of thing. And so I realized that I think that there's an opportunity for me to really kind of work with these kids and kind of be able to kind of meet them where they are. And um, so I changed my major to elementary education. I really loved it. And it was great. Got all the way to, to the end, to my student teaching. And then I think I got kind of caught up in the bureaucracy that is our kind of school system. It just was a little bit. Um, it, it like dampens creativity a little bit. Well, I mean, it was, uh, you know, it's so tied to, it's just like you forget because you think that it's such a noble type of cause, right? It's just such an honorable thing to say that, you know, you're teaching kids and a teaching, obviously we talk about them as, you know, essential and everything and they are, but it's a job still. And every job you still have a boss and that boss is, has a boss. And maybe that, maybe that didn't, you know, maybe you didn't have a good boss, you know, and stuff like that. And so you kind of forget about that and, and how the school system gets funded and based off of testing and based off of demographics and all this other really kind of upsetting red tape that, that allows you to kind of do that. I mean, I was, I think back to my education system and I got kind of put into a, a program that was uh, a little bit of an off, 
you know, kind of an ex- advanced type of thing that they did, which is really fluid and kind of an experimental type of, you know, learning system. And, I, and I, it was a night and day difference. The teacher really was, you know, the curriculum was very fluid and allowed kids to kind of explore where they wanted to explore. And, it, and I think it made a huge difference in my life as opposed to the more systematic teaching to the test type of thing. And so from there, um, because I was working the entire time through, you know, to, to help with what to pay for college, I, I needed a night job. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to work at an overnight, you know, like a convenience store, or, you know, Walmart or something like that. I was like, well, I'm a big guy, you know, six, five or whatever it is. So I was like, I'll be a bouncer. I saw this place that was hiring for bouncers and door guys. And then, um, pretty quickly realized I'm a pacifist and that's not, you know, breaking up fights. And it's not my thing to do. I remember it was kind of like a moment where I was, you know, working and, you know, having to just, you know, wipe off whatever off of my shirt after taking out the garbage and et cetera, et cetera. And then I look over and see the bartenders, you know, counting hundreds of dollars. And I was like, wait, you get to talk with people and hang out and making this kind of, I was like, what? it's like, Hey, can I do that <laughs> kind of thing? And, you know, and I fell in love with bartending. And then from there it ran the, the owner of the club was doing some garage sale level flyers that I was like, yo, this is, this is bunk. I, I, you can't, I, you can't put this in a, in an ad. And so I was like, tell you what, can I, can I do this? Can I, can I take over the logo? Can I, can I run the, can I do my own ads? And, and it, you know, so I just did, I was like, I'll do it for free. I just, I want to be proud of where I work <laughs> kind of thing. And so, you know, taught myself Photoshop, started a kind of started a um, design company and started doing ads for some of the local bars there, did our own ads and changed our logo and started a website and, you know, so on and so forth. And, um, kind of fell in love with the industry that the, networking of it was really fascinating because it was this watering hole. It quite literally is the, the imagery is the, the watering oasis out there in some Saharan desert that has crocodiles, giraffes, rhinoceros, and, you know, hippopotamus and elephants all drinking from it. It was like that from all walks of life. Everyone came in. It was at college station. There's only one of a number of a lot of bars, but we were the only kind of nightclub that was there. And so for that vibe, for that kind of DJ dance party, that type of stuff is the only one there. And, uh, you know, everyone went there. And so pretty quickly you kind of got to know everybody. And I just really enjoyed that aspect of it. Um, realized that people's guards are down when you're taking care of them and having it, showing them a good time and stuff like that. So then have these groups that maybe have no business being meshed together that all of a sudden are meshed together. And thus I really enjoyed it because, it kind of broke me out of my little friend circle. It was like, no, well, I have a friend here and I have a, this person here and I connected with this person there. And all of them was because they just, you know, I took care of them. So have you always been a really social guy? You know, uh, I don't feel like, I don't think I was, I, I don't think I struggled with it. I still consider myself and anybody who knows me was probably, you know, rolling their eyes a little bit. I, I still consider a little bit of a, like one of the, what they were, you would call an, um, uh, extroverted introvert right um, the ambivert in between yeah well it's more of like a, you know i think my understanding of it and and you know any say uh psychiatrist out there or you know whoever you know i don't know which ist person would would properly define this is i kind of have an understanding of the difference between the two being which kind of energizes you and what what drains you more so than what you're good at you know and so while i may be good at the working a room, talking, doing something like this. It's um, when I'm in a crowd, when I'm in a room having to entertain a lot of people or in a, in a party setting that where you have to get to know a lot of people, it drains me. doesn't mean I'm bad at it, I, I'm, but I, I recharge by having a coffee with one person sitting by myself and reading or doing anything of those type of things. Uh, the quality time aspect of a one-on-one interaction is what revitalizes me um, while you know, the, the restaurant business drains me, even though I'm, I might be talented at it, you know, I might be good at it. It's, it's just, that's kind of where it is. So it, it, that's kind of where I've kind of landed over the last 20 years of recognizing it's like, no, I mean, I enjoy it, but what I really enjoy is, is some one-on-one interaction. The, like, and I treat that even at the restaurants where, you know, for whatever reason you join in on somebody's vibration and you're like, yo, this person's real dope. And you have a conversation with them about the food or even that one minute interaction and you notice something or, or the fact that this person's come in a couple times and they become kind of a regular and then you can connect with somebody in that way. That 
to me is so much more valuable to me than the idea of looking across at this kind of full room buzzing energy like that doesn't I mean it's wonderful to see it's great obviously for business but that doesn't energize me like the I remember like one of the more prominent ones for Swift's Attic we opened and I remember they came and had his family came in and had dinner and it was their son's freshman orientation and then four years later they came for their graduation dinner you know, but they've come in throughout the time and I've kind of watched him develop and grow. And it was like, oh man, it's like, has it been four years already? And it's like, they're like, yeah, of course. This is a, they kind of closed that loop. And it was just so special to me that, that I could be a part of that, you know? And, and I love that aspect. I love looking across the room and kind of figuring out like, oh man, who's on first dates and who's here talking about something that they need to work through. And then, you know, or who's here with a long lost friend and they're, reconnecting and how, how we can help facilitate that experience. That stuff is what, you know, really kind of gets me going as opposed to just like the party, you know, gotcha. As despite what it feels like, you know, what it seems like. Yeah. So, so do you frequent the restaurants that you own? Um, cause I mean, I feel like a lot of restaurant owners don't, or that I just don't know. Cause I wouldn't recognize them if I was in right, a restaurant. Right. 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 Um, I have the, the, the kind of the model that we started, my, my business partner and I is, we, I start, operate, and then we develop, we built the next one. I operate and kind of backfill that position. So now I'm working on uh, a project with the, the Hope Outdoor Gallery. I have a small, I have a relatively small consulting that kind of fills in, like the mortar that kind of fills in the gaps between the major projects, Hope being the major one right now. Um, native being another major one, Native Hostel. Cool. Let's go into those. I want to get more into the backstory of Swift Static and how you started. But now that we're on Hope Outdoor Gallery and we've mentioned it, we might as well just explain what it is. So sure. Can you, can you talk about it? Yeah. So, you know, zoom back a decade ago, um, my partner, Andy, uh, Andy Skull, who is a long-term friend, I've literally known her 20 years, you know, um, she uh, started this as, as over off of Baylor Street, like 11th and Baylor over there off of. Castle Hill area. Yeah. Uh, it was the, the failed, the foundation of a failed c condo project, you know? So it's just a bunch of walls of a building that never came to be. This is graffiti park at graffiti Castle Hills. Graffiti park at Castle Hills, right. So she used it or wanted it as a, um, as an installation. It was a temporary thing. Got a hold of, you know, Vic, the landlord over there. And, you know, she was kind of, known for doing these awesome pop-up events and really great in the community. And so she put together this, um, this pop-up kind of installation. Uh, you know, if I, at the time I actually didn't even recognize the, um, the significance of it. It was just, she wants she, this is what she did. And it just became this thing. It just really gelled and really evolved into, um, this incredible community for artists and what ended up happening is it grew and as people fell in love with the project we were able to you know the landlord with the help of the landlord was really kind of stave off the development of it to keep it going i mean it was supposed to be i believe a few months of an installation and it turned into nine years you know That's, and sorry to interrupt you but yeah, yeah it's came up on the podcast before i was telling you before um lucas gilkey the owner of hometown hero was inspired by the art at graffiti park at castle hills and hired some of those artists to do the labeling and he gives them a percentage of the art on the labels and it's really right. cool labels and stuff yeah and that's then that's what it is that's the um what motivated us is to see this community and to recognize that you know between me and andy and and you know the other people a lot of these artists i think a lot of people don't feel like being an artist is a viable job it's almost like what a risk it is and in reality a lot of it's just because it's just not taught that way and it's not we don't have the infrastructure to kind of do that because it's just never treated that way um and we we kind of aim to change that we want to disrupt the way that the arts are kind of viewed and funded and you know it is a the, the park over there was a non-profit run entity and we kind of thought about it that we believe that particularly the arts are able to um, eat what it kills, right? We should be able to, to have a, a platform or a venue or something that allows um, people to come out, support the artists, support the local artists, have an education program to teach an artist who wants to be, you know, who wants to learn how to incorporate themselves, how to start an S corp, how to, you know, maybe, you know, how to teach somebody how to do this or to even at the very least, 
you know, steel st- sharpened steel to be around a community of artists that they can develop. I mean, not everyone has that inner vandal in them that puts on a hoodie and goes and paints underneath a bridge to practice, you know, and not everybody has that in them. While that's a very valuable part of the culture, I think is this kind of, you know, cutting edge, you know, voice of the streets type of thing that we love. There's also some people that can, can really need to have some areas to practice. I mean, this is one of the stories that I remember so clearly is there's an artist that used one of the walls um, out at the park, the, the, the one on Castle Hill to paint a giant, you know, a big 20 foot mural as an audition piece for somebody, because if you're an unknown artist, you know, somebody who has a large budget that wants to paint a big 20 foot mural, it's not going to take a chance on somebody without kind of seeing it, what your skills are, but where it's kind of a catch 22, like what comes first, right? Are you chicken and the egg? So, all right, I don't know if you can do it, so I can't hire you to do it, but I can't hire you to do it until you know that you can do it. And so being able to have this opportunity for them to practice these large murals and to showcase these art and for someone like uh, Lucas to go out there and find an artist and go, man, I really love this person's work. And you don't know if that person is a world famous, has made it their living as an artist or somebody who just got out there for the first time and is just practicing, you know, who knows, maybe they like, you like their style and you have the opportunity to kind of discover themselves. You know, it's like a very analog SoundCloud, right? <laughs> it's kind yeah. of like, you know, yeah. so um, but yeah, so we knew that we had to move. Ultimately, that area is going to be developed. There's nothing we can do about it. And in searching, we searched for the last, you know, five years, probably to different places and trying to work with the city, maybe to become part of a public park or not and everything. And finally, we found a space out there by the airport, um, you know, by Carson Creek um, that, you know, found some land that's perfect. And, you know, through a brilliant design idea from Andy that it'll kind of we're over between two flight paths of the airplanes so from the sky it spells out the word hope you can see what the top of the buildings in the park that's and, so cool and uh you know and we have uh, all of us involved me um andy liz whittington and antonio we all have other jobs you know and so it's wonderful because we can really put our heart into this in so far as to make sure that it stays true to its root, which is to provide a community center to, to push the envelope as far as how charity is handled. Um, you know, to have a venue that charities can go into and know that we are of the same minded, that the, the profit motive is not always leveraging, you know, what we can do to, to help you raise money for your cause. And for us to, you know, if we can get thousands of people to come out and look at amazing art and then just sell them a bottle of water and a coffee or, or a cocktail, then we can fund it ourselves. You know, we can fund our own charity. We can fund the summer camps for kids to come and practice. You know, we're, we, you know, we're working with a group called uh, hip hop for hope. That's going to be teaching breakdancing lessons and, and, you know, these type of um, host the Olympic trials for breakdancing, you know, and, and this, the, the possibilities are endless. Arts are full encompassing. Obviously my first addition was to say that culinary arts, you know, we're going to put a commissary kitchen out there and to be able to teach, um, you know, cooking classes to under, you know, underprivileged, underserved communities or privileged and served communities that want to come out there and let their tuition help pay for somebody else that can, you know, that can, who aren't as unable to, but then to explore that aspect and to really learn and to really educate because, you know, so many times summer camps, especially the ones that I went to, particularly for under, <laughs> underprivileged youth, uh, it's like daycare, right? It's really there to, to trust, trying to, to watch a kid, give their parents a breather kind of thing, you know, but now you're seeing this movement towards these camps that are really trying to provide some life skills and to really kind of teach these kids that they can do that. I mean, I don't, it wasn't an option for me to be a chef growing up. That wasn't an idea. That wasn't something, but maybe we can, and maybe we can, you know, I had this idea that, um, when my friends were in, you know, some of my chef friends that were in culinary school and they're practicing and they're cooking and they bring home, you know, 20 bagels that they baked that day. And I'm like, what am I do with 20 bagels? But it's like, well, think about that, you know, summer camp may be providing food to feed a community of people who need food, you know, and that food can kind of become this life cycle and we're educating and also taking care of the people who are in need and kind of create this ecosystem that is just full of love, hope, and, you know, positivity. And, and that really resonated with all of us. And, and so that's what we're trying to do. It's audacious. 
you know, but it's, it, it yeah. looks beautiful. I saw the pictures on Instagram. People Thank should you. check it out. It's at Hope Outdoor Gallery, I believe. If not, I'll put it in the show notes. But um, they said, you know, laying it brick by brick. It's beautiful brick walls and the graffiti at Castle Hills is amazing. So this whole project's super exciting. It really yeah. adds to Austin arts and culture. And if you can, you know, do these fund these charities and stuff with them even better, you know? Yeah. The, um, you know, we just want to be able to do that and do some good shows out there and, and, and obviously have a, have a, and some place for families to go to do things. Obviously now being outdoors is super important. So the timing is pretty good with that. And then, um, you know, largely it is just a, an opportunity to, to move, to treat art as a career, as a, as with the reverence that it deserves, um, especially particularly, you know, outdoor street art. And um, it's great the, the brick by brick program is amazing because we're using all earthen bricks. And we just found out a couple of weeks ago that we're the largest earthen structure in the history of Texas. I think oh, really? because we use Austin dirt and all kind of recycled materials to make these bricks, literally compressing um, this, you know, uh, compressing these bricks into bricks that we can build a wall from using the dirt that was excavated out to build a foundation. It's really kind of the zero carbon footprint type of thing. And we're doing rainwater collection and we'll do solar out there to try to make sure this giant facility is relatively carbon negative or at least carbon neutral, you know, kind of thing. And so, I, you know, I think it's a proof of concept, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I have big goals. I think we have big goals. I think that we hope that this would become um, something that comes part of the, the culture of Austin to say we're one of the exciting parts for me that we're five minutes from the airport is, you know, uh, dramatically maybe, but I'm saying that the fall of Western civilization was us not one of the, one of the terrible things that happened to us in my lifetime was not being able to say bye to people at the airport. I remember you, I'm, I'm old enough to remember being at the window and waving at the plane as it flies, you know, with my uncle in it or my, you know, my cousin or my mother or whatever it is. And I remember, standing at the jet, you know, at the end of the jetway and seeing them at the end and having them, you know, grab their bags and run to the rest of the jetway and, and what that meant to give that first, you know, that first or last kind of embrace, you know, and I, and I think the, the hostage level kicking out of the car when you're driving through the, you know, driving through the security line, I think it damaged us. I think it damaged us more than we'd like to admit, you know, and, and so there's a, there's a part of me that has this dream that we're going to have a shuttle that kind of goes back and forth from the airport to the thing, a free shuttle awesome. uh, or donations based probably um, at the, at the very least to be able to say that maybe part of the, the new culture will be, Hey, you know, Justin, you got a flight at five o'clock. Why don't we meet at Hope at three, grab lunch, go look at some dope art, you know, grab a cocktail, grab a coffee, take a picture in front of an awesome mural, give a proper hug. I go home, you hop on the shuttle and get to your flight. And, Love and it. instead of this driving through and kick you out the car, you know, I, I just, I don't know. I just feel like, I feel like there's something cathartic about that. And, um, you know, who knows, but that's, that's my hope. I think it'll be great, man. Thanks. So I've, I mean, I've been following you on Instagram and stuff and you talk a lot about, you know, charity, helping the community and stuff like that. Has that always been a big thing for you or is that something that as you got more successful, you saw that you're able to do more help for other people? It's always been a thing. Um, I will say that it, it's evolved. I think there was a part of my head that I always gravitated towards this dream of signing that big novelty check over to a charity you know like where you sit there and you hold up at some thing at some auction that hey this, you know this organization signed a check for fifty thousand dollars or whatever it was and i kind of had that vision but it's evolved and i think it's evolved to the point where any anybody can help at any time at any level um you know one of the things i was talking to somebody the other day it came up with an idea that says that you know all of our arms are different lengths and different strengths you know and so we don't have to give in the same way and in the same capacity, but it starts with the the heart of it. It starts that you want to help and then figure out where you can go. Somebody asked me, what's the best way to do, to make meaningful change, meaningful um, action. And I was like, well, it's got to mean something to you first. That's what you got to figure out. Because once it does take that meaning, take that belief and then intersect it with what your resources are, figure it out. I think that's something to think about. My girlfriend, she's done some volunteering and she's gave me a tip. She said the most rewarding volunteering for her is when she was volunteering at something that she was skilled at, like yes. coaching people on personal finance or something. She's like, since I know how to do that well, it's yeah. just like I can actually use my, the skills that I have to pass on to other people. 100%. I mean, that's why it's like one of those things where it's 
it's, you know, it comes from logistical minded for me for operating businesses and operating restaurants and, and the hospitality side. But it's like, we, we can't, you know, I never stood in the way of my, my, you know, servers or bartenders to say, you need to use this script because this is the way to do it. It's like, no, figure out what the end goal is, figure out what you've got and do it. You might be, you know, a really fast bartender and that's what you're good at. And so put yourself and say, I'm going to work the speed well and make sure that I get the servers, their drinks faster. And then, you know, you might be the kind of person that can wax poetic with everybody. Well, then your better bet might be working Monday night because you might be, you know, you might be able to take that experience and, and really turn it into something special. And, and so it's like these, the idea of understanding of what your skill set is and finding where that intersects with what you want to do to give back. It is, it, it, it'll never be truly, you know, poignant or, or powerful to you until it's, until it means something. I agree with her 100% because you can find something that you're already passionate about because you've spent your, you know, your, your time, your energy developing that skill. And now you can have that opportunity to, to do it. I mean, during the snowpocalypse, right? Snowvid, whatever you want to call it during that time, you know, I was working with Austin mutual aid, um, after, you know, the water initiative. I don't know if you saw that. Um, yes. and one of the things we needed a lot of bilingual dispatchers, right? Some people that can speak to these families that are in need and the bilingual aspect was very, very important. And so we found it's like, yeah, so you might not be able to cut a check and help out, or you might not be able to make a donation monetarily, or you might not even have the time or the car to go and drive and make these deliveries or the ability to do that. But if your skill set is you happen to speak English and Spanish, then you were uh, at one point in time, you were like gold. You were valuable, valuable, not that you were more valuable than this, but it was a, than any other position. It was just that skill set was just very critical. And so, you know, it, that would be at, there was a time when I needed that more than a donation, right? Because we had some donations, but how could we even get it to people without you, without this person? And so, you know, recognizing that where you can take that and find out where your skill and your gifts can cross over to give back to your community is, um, is paramount. Now, before all that, you got to care about the community. I can't tell you how to do that. I can't tell you how to care about the community. That's, that's the thing. And, and again, I'm not virtue signaling or trying to shame people for not doing stuff. I mean, but, but when you wake up in the morning and then you go out there and you go about your business and you look in the community and if you see something that you said, you know, I would like to help this out, or I feel like I have a, a, a need or a want to do that, then you should answer that call that, that uncomfortable, uh, somebody needs to do something about this. Um, I, I tend to answer that call more often than not when I feel uncomfortable or I feel like this shouldn't happen or this shouldn't be the way it works instead of just going home and saying, and it shouldn't be the way it does it. It's I say, well, what can we do about it? You know? And, um, and that's the one minor difference I think is, you know, the, the name of the, the video that we posted was called, uh, what can we do to help? Mm -hmm. That's it. Ask that question. Somebody will answer that question. Somebody will tell you, go, Talk to the community that needs your help. Hey, what can we do to help? Somebody tell you, yeah, just watch this door for a second. You know, hold my, hold the leash while I tie my shoe. You know, it's literally just asking. And, and when we're so isolated, I think that we, we don't want to, you know, put obligations on people. We don't want to, you know, bother somebody. And there's a lot of pride and dignity involved for asking for help. And, but if somebody offers it, a lot of times, you know, it's like, you know what, that would be pretty good. You know, somebody's struggling with groceries and you're just looking at them. It's like, I'm sure they could probably use some help. I'm just going to walk to my car. But instead of sitting there going, good, can I, you know, can I help you out? And they should be like, yeah, actually, <laughs> you know, but they're not going to ask a stranger for their help. Not, not everyone has that in them. So, you know, I think that we should take it upon ourselves to look for the need and, and see what we can do. I have the good luck of every time I get out of my car, someone's like, hey, can you help us carry this refrigerator into our house? And I'm like, yeah. I guess that happened. Yeah. And then another person was like, I got out of the car and they're like, Hey man. And there was a couch in the back and I was like, yep, I know you're going to ask I got you. me. <laughs> well, I'm a tall dude. So I, I, I got a lot of light bulbs changing in my life. <laughs> my aunts and my aunts and uncles used to always do that. Invite me over for dinner. And all of a sudden I look on a dining table. There's like six light bulbs. I'm like, I got you. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So, so how do you feel about um, Austin right now? Is there anything current events or in the future, anything that we need to work on or, or do better? 
you know, I think we're all growing. I think we have to look at Austin as a as a part of a larger ecosystem. You know, I mean, I think that as Austin grows, obviously it's growing so rapidly. You're you're we're having growing pains. You know, we have to decide who we are as a as a community, and we have to you know, to kind of dissect each of these communities and figure out. I, I'm not one, I'm not in a position to say something is right or wrong. It's really more of, do I want to be a part of a community that does this? Do I want to be a part of a community that does that? It's, are each individual, you know, preferences in a way. Um, we tend to speak, I think the problem is, we tend to speak in these large universal truths. And yes, I understand that. There's some large universal truths about social justice. But as we've seen, even those can be disagreed on. So at the end, I think what we need to really look at is to recognize that um, these things, you, you're okay with it or you're not okay with it. And it's hard to admit because when you push somebody to that kind of binary decision, either the line is drawn, you're either okay with this or you're not okay with this. People try to gray it. People try to say, well, you know, I feel this, not really, that's not kind of, and then you're like, no, no, no. It, like we can, we can hash it out, but truthfully you're on this side of, you're on this side of the tracks for that kind of discussion on any issue. Obviously we're very divided on a lot of, a lot of issues, particularly being a very progressive city and a very conservative state. Right. And, and as we see, as the state kind of moves more split right down the middle, almost, it's even more so. Um, but I think what we all need to work on as a society, as a city, as a as a country, uh, and this is going to be very bold to say, is we need to create space to have that conversation. That's the difficult part right now. I think that what you're doing right here is paramount, meaning while we might agree on a lot of things, um, people need to have this right here, which is sitting in a conversation in a safe space to say that you can speak your opinion without necessarily um, having to agree with the person that you're sitting across from. Um, I think that while I'm, uh, I totally understand the idea that not everyone is equipped, willing, suited, or even wants to be that teacher. We would ideally want people to, to do the work themselves, but there needs to be a space for, I, I call it to, to be a patient teacher uh, or a patient um, opponent, right? Because we need the opportunity to take somebody and to recognize that, to kind of pinpoint the person who might be opposition because they're, unaware of your position. They might be opposition because they've just held it for a long time and nobody's ever presented the opposing view. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that we're probably more alike than we are different. And we kind of lost sight of that, I think. I feel like I agree with that. I feel like that's, we're moving away from, farther away from, I don't know, talking things out and more of just kind of like there's just two sides or whatever. Yeah, just choose a side. And, yeah. and, and, and it's, it's easier that way. It's very, you know, people call it an uncomfortable conversation. It's not. It's not uncomfortable for me. You should work on it. Anything you do, practice, you get better at. You should practice until it's no longer uncomfortable. It's just one of those things. Um, I remember growing up as a kid, I was that kid that let the people knocking on the door to spread whatever they were trying to spread the Jehovah's witness or whatever it was that were knocking on the door. I was the guy that brought them in. Cause I'm like, Oh, you got the truth. Well, well come on in. You know, I've, I've, I've been going to this building every, every Sunday that they said they got the truth. So maybe you got the truth. <laughs> let's, you know, let's hear it. That's and funny. to, to, because I feel like data is important. I feel like information is important and then draw it. It's, I have a battle. I think our biggest problem, um, I keep using these superlatives. One of our largest problems is confirmation bias, right? As a science-minded person, the, to make a conclusion in every other aspect of your life, generally, logically, you should get all the data and draw a conclusion for, from it, right? As much data as you can and draw as educated of a conclusion off of it as you can. What we've done is flipped it backwards. 
and created this confirmation bias where you're creating a conclusion out of your hopes, dreams, and wants, and then searching for the data to defend that, to balance that, finding groups of people that like that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the, if I went out on onto the highway and I was looking for blue cars, I'm going to find blue cars. Does that mean that there's more blue cars than there are red cars? No, because all I'm looking for are blue cars. You know, that's not accurate and it's not beneficial. And at the end of the day, you create this echo chamber. You know, I live by that creed. You know, I, I like I've always said, if I'm the smartest person in the room, I'm in the wrong room. I don't I don't want I don't want to be not challenged in my relationships, in my friendships, in everything. It should challenge me because that challenge grows us. You know, we recognize that in in health, right? Resistance training, working out, all that stuff. This conversation is working out for me. Right. This is exercise because I'm being recorded. So I have to be held accountable for what I say. And so this recognition that at the time I have to say, do I really believe that? Am I OK with saying this out into the world and causes me to think about that? The Internet has created this terrible opportunity that you can say stuff and not be held accountable for it because you're an anonymous person. You can just throw it out there. You can just throw this grenade into a room and then not realize how many people it's hurt. You know, um, that causes damage. It really does. And this is an unseen side effect as many wonderful things that the social media and the and technology and all that has created. You don't realize that when you say something offensive to somebody in real life, you have to counteract the, comp the possibility this guy's going to punch you in the face or look hurt and you can see it in their face. This, what is it? It's however many, 90% of communication is nonverbal, right? This idea that when you say something that's just horribly hurtful across the, you're just in 40 characters, 140 characters, and just boop, send it out into the world, you don't see what that does. You don't see how it triggers or traumatizes or whatever it is somebody else, and you don't realize that. But if you said that to that person in real life, I dare you not to feel something if you see somebody and all of a sudden you can see it just crush them or, or hurt them or, or, or maybe enlighten somebody or whatever it is, look at it on the positive. So all of that are stuff that we need to combat because – this is the information age. We have to master this. It's not going anywhere. So we have to learn how to navigate it and we have to recognize these. We have to figure out how to create a connection now that connections are fast, easy, and anonymous. So we need to make sure that we have the ability and the opportunity to have these conversations. I, I have a, a group that gathers, you know, once a month that we started kind of in the beginning of the summer of the social justice, the Black Lives Matter movement. And, and we kind of talked about how we can be better allies and everything like that. And I, one of the things I press in this group is this can't stop here. We're an echo chamber. We all agree. We're all high-fiving each other and patting each other on our back here. This conversation should be gearing you up and training you and getting you ready to have this conversation with your parents or when somebody says something in a group that you are ancillary friends with or whatever it is that you previously would be like, oh, I can't talk to this person and sit there and say, hold up, why do you feel that way? And be curious and be genuine. You have to be genuine. Like, why do you feel that way? That I, maybe it's a curse or a gift, but I'm genuinely curious when somebody believes something that I'm, you know, diametrically opposed to. I'm like, wait, you really don't like pizza? You know, like, what? Like, I'm curious. I want to know. I don't sit there and go, you're crazy. When the world, who, who doesn't like this, this kind of this thought that doesn't cross my mind. My first thought is, man, I am fat. Tell me more what is going on. And I feel that way about everything. Um, if I, if I find somebody who generally opposes what I, or, you know, disagrees with what something that I agree very strongly on, my first reaction isn't to convert this person or to push back. My first reaction is like, well, I mean, maybe this person knows something I don't. And um, it's very easy to kind of fall into this echo chamber because you're surrounded by people that agree with you yeah. and, and you have to, you have to venture out. You got to make space for that conversation. Not for everybody. It's a bell curve. There's some people on this side that are never going to change their mind and people on this side that might never change their mind. Don't worry about those. Worry about the people who, who you care about and that legitimately like might be able to grow you and grow them and have that conversation. I, I think that's what we all need to work on. For sure. And maybe things like Clubhouse and a push towards real-time communication online as opposed to, you know, 
you know, asynchronous communication or whatever yeah. will be more of like, you know, you immediately, if you said something they responded to, maybe as tech gets better, the internet gets better. There's more of that and less of like, you know, post something and just whatever. For sure. Heard a bunch of For sure. Feelings. I think that that's what, you know, you, you we're, we're all trying to, the irony of the whole thing is that we're trying to recreate what we've been missing. We, the, the novelty of it, the, the, the convenience of it, um, is, intoxicating right like i don't know how we ever made plans without text messaging you know i, I remember as a kid that, that was when people kept their plans because exactly <laughs> exactly no, no. and then that's what, it's, what's funny about that that that's what i mean is that that's where the side effect that we we weren't aware of this instantaneous communication of wherever you were seems very convenient very beneficial but the truth is it allows you to cancel up to the last second and it allows you to be flaky to that last level where it used to be, you know, if you and I had lunch plans and I left my house, there's no way you can get a hold of me on the road. You had to call the restaurant or I'd be at the restaurant going, did he get in an accident? Did something happen? And, and legitimately people may, uh, plan around that knowing that there's no way that we can cancel and you were way more, you know, apt to be, kept your word yeah. in that way but now we know we could literally cancel the moment before you know these maybe start to become very strong because you can make that decision up until the last possible minute and we're trying to combat that we're all trying to figure that out it's the same thing with communications with email all this stuff so now as people are realizing and then feeling that lack and without even necessarily understanding it we're creating this reconnection by having face-to-face -face communication is one of those things that happened in the beginning of the pandemic of being in quarantine. I'm a first adopter. I'm a tech nerd, ran a pirate board in middle school, you know, and in high school with, uh, you know, with my best friends and stuff like that. And we did all that. So I, you know, we dreamed about the Dick Tracy video, watch video conferencing, all that stuff, the technology and how amazing it would be. And then I never used it. It just became so inconvenient because it's so much easier to drop a text and, you know, to call somebody or, you know, or whatever it is. And then all of a sudden during quarantine, you, you felt starved for seeing your friends and connecting with them. So guess what? House party started, you know, FaceTime started. I started having FaceTime lunch meetings where we would just sit across from each other, look at each other's this computer screen, uh, this phone screen, and eat lunch together. Me, my sandwich, him, their bowl of soup, or whatever it is. And it surprisingly felt like I was having lunch with the person, you know? Nice. And this created this unusual connection because guess what? When you laugh, you saw them smile. When you said something, you know, intense, they were looking at you and, and, and making eye contact through a screen, but it was still eye contact. And you felt this thing where you're like, whoa, like this is amazing. And during that time is when it was, I have, you know, my sister and my nephews and, you know, her, uh, her husband live out in San Jose, you know, we'd text and we'd call. My sister is one of the most important people in my entire life. And I was like, why don't I FaceTime them more often? I can watch my nephew and talk to him and watch him grow and just hang out with him. Or I would call and FaceTime when they're doing anything. I said, like, what are you doing? We're just having dinner. And she'd wave the phone around the room and I'd say, hi to him. And it's like, why, what, what, what took me so long? You know, it's just inconvenience because guess what? When you're FaceTiming, you got to sit still for a second. You can't do something else. You can't be playing a, you know, watching TV while that's happening. You can't, you know, do 10 other things that we get caught up in doing. You have to connect with the person. That's what's happening. You know, and I, and I love it. I think it's wonderful. And, 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 you know, next thing you know, we're going to be back to having coffee with each other again. Oh my God, what's that going to be like, you know, <laughs> yeah. stuff like that, you know, so we're getting there soon and we're yeah. towards end of time. But so I want to get more into Swift's attic, if you don't mind, because mm -hmm. that was, was that your first restaurant? Technically? Yeah. I mean, we can skip over the real, I had a, I had a kind of a bad business deal where I was naive and signed on and, and helped develop a concept that, that never amounted for me to get anything out of it. So uh, we can skip through it. Everybody, we all have one of those under our belts. It was just a, I did, I signed on the wrong dotted line. But you started off, you, you transitioned to be a bartender and that was, you, you fell in love with the restaurant industry and yep. you know, the community aspect of it and seeing people come in. Yep. Then you got the ambition to want to start your own. Well, I started there. I moved to Austin. My sister's going to UT. I started at a corporate bar and grill 
called the Fox and Hound. It used to be over here on Fourth Street, you know. Um, ran that for a couple of years and then ran and ran Kenichi, which was my first kind of foray into um, finer dining, you know, high end dining. Um, and I loved it. That, you know, we became one of the things that really happened from a networking, the social aspect that really served me really well is like the statesman wrote something about us being one of the four hardest restaurants to get into. So all of a sudden it was like a hot ticket. Like people were, you know, calling me begging for a table or we start all of a sudden became this kind of, you know, this gatekeeping type of situation. And it was great because it really networked because a lot of people who loved what we were doing all of a sudden wanted to get to know us and become regulars. And, and we started developing friends and stuff like that. So that was my first instinct ran that for about three years. Um, and then went on to this other project that, that did pretty well. And then went from there to, um, a consulting type of mini thing just to help out my current business partner with a business venture that he had a restaurant that he had, um, kind of took over, helped them out for uh, help over there, worked there for about two years. And then he was like, I told him, I was like, my ultimate goal was to open my own. And then he just hit me and had this kind of moment where we really had this very almost difficult conversation. And I, you know, I'm still so thankful for him for that, that day, which it was a very difficult situation because I was just kind of nestling into operating this restaurant again, just back into my comfort zone of just operating this restaurant. And he was like, look, are you going do you want to open your own place or not? Because you haven't done anything to, to develop this new concept that we need. It's like, I can find somebody else to do this if they want to, but you, why are you doing this? You're not replacing yourself. You're not backfilling. You're not delegating. You're not doing any of these things that somebody needs to do to scale. You know, I'm ready to do this restaurant with you, but you got to do it. What are you doing over here still? Why are you still working Monday night here instead of finding a manager to replace you? So because I need you to come knock on my door and say, look, I'm ready. Let's go look at locations. Let's go talk about business plans. Let's talk about fundraising. Let's talk about all that. And it was just this really kind of like, I was like, man, I don't know what to do. And he's like, what do you mean you don't know what to do? You've done it. You know, we're doing it right now. Well, if you don't know, why don't we talk about it? You know, and it was this very poignant moment, this tipping point that was very good. And then we, he went and then boom, next thing we know, we kind of came up with this concept of Swift's Attic that evolved and found this location and it just kind of became there. And again, we lumped together that somebody wrote about us, called us the Justice League because it was my executive chef from you know, Uchiko and Vespaio or Uchi and Vespaio. There wasn't an Uchiko then, uh, Uchi and Vespaio and then pastry chef from, you know, Parkside and, you know, the sous chef from Wink. And I mean, it was just like all these kind of big players in the Austin restaurant scene. We all came together to kind of put together this crazy restaurant and, and got a lot of kind of buzz because of it. And then, you know, we, again, the idea was this kind of for us, by us, FUBU of restaurants, which is like, you know, kind of disrupt this idea of, how fine dining should be. I was one of those people that I'm like, yeah, it shouldn't be stuffy. I want good food, but I don't want it to be quiet. And that's where the hip hop came from. Oh, the hip hop thing came from, we were there. So the first day grand opening weekend, um, we were just playing basic ambient music. It wasn't anything, you know, some like the kind of, you know, whatever that station was that had that kind of basic, you know, kind of vibey type of music. And uh, it was a day that MCA from the Beastie Boys passed away. And obviously being a hip hop head, I was like, oh, that's you know devastating to me. It was just a, it was a tough day. And, and it was like, all right, I'll tell you what. One of the things we did over there was to rebel against this. We, we wanted to embrace the craft beer movement. But at the same time, I didn't want to be bougie. So I didn't want people to feel like, oh, if they wanted to drink, you know, Miller Lite, like, uh, we don't serve that here. Kind of like I hated that vibe. And yeah, so yeah. I was like, all right, so we're going to carry all these craft beers, but we're going to carry Mickey's hand grenades. We're going to carry these like, you know, bootleg, you know, st malt liquor that you buy from the corner store, you know, whatever. And so we carried Mickey's hand grenades. And one of the things we were like, all right, so what we're going to do is um, pour a little out. If we're going to sell these Mickey's hand grenades for like three bucks, we're going to pour a little out, pour some uh, orange juice in them, sell brass monkeys. And uh, we're going to donate all the um, the proceeds to the Milarepa, to the, you know, their their foundation, the Beastie Boys Foundation. And um, so that night, packed house, grand, you know, it's kind of grand opening weekend, Friday night, you know, nine o'clock comes around, we're jamming, we're still on like a two hour wait, you know, everyone's there having a great time. 
And uh, I was like, all right. So moment of silence, just turned off all the music till people kind of noticed it was about a minute and everyone's kind of like looking around the music. And then I just cranked brass monkey, like, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, people stood up and clapped and people were like, you know, just really feeling it. I was like, oh, okay. I didn't know that Austin was like that. I was like, okay, okay. <laughs> so I just played the rest of, you know, played a whole playlist that was had, you know, a bunch of the license to ill and then played Paul's boutique. And, 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 and it was like, just, and then I ran out of beastie boy tracks and then started playing, you know, Biggie tribe and, you know, Wu Tang and all this other stuff and all my favorite, you know, nineties hip hop. And people were coming up to me afterwards like, yo, I've never experienced something like this. We're eating quail and, you know, this amazing, you know, really kind of chef driven eccentric small plates and listening to Tupac and listening to, you know, to, to tribe and our side and all this other stuff, you know, the roots. And, uh, I just like, wow, I didn't realize that. So it just became a thing. And, you know, I played my music probably two notches higher than the average restaurant because it's part of the experience. You know, I want you to laugh loudly. I don't want you to be at a dinner table. Somebody says something funny. You're like, ah, oh, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's like, no, man. It's like when you're here with your friend, you should be loud. You should be enjoy. You should enjoy yourself. If you're not, if that's not the vibe you want, there are restaurants that you can be quiet. Go to them. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be that. I'm not trying to be everything to everybody. But I want that when I'm with my friends, I want to have a good time, share food, enjoy ourselves, laugh when somebody says something funny, you know, cry when somebody says something sad. Like, that's just the way it should be. That's the way I, in my, I envisioned the food experience is that we are facilitating this connection. The music is part of that experience. And it's all I never understood the reason of why the music that you listen to driving up to the restaurant couldn't be played at the restaurant. It just didn't make any sense. It's like, why That's is true? It, why, why, you know, why would jam and turn off the radio and go up there and listen to some elevator music? It's like, why? Like, what does this become this thing? It's like, no, man, it's like, just listen to it. It's like, I, this is my, one of my biggest joys is looking at the room and seeing people, you know, bobbing their head, eating their food and, or singing along or whatever it is. And that, that to me, like you're, you're hitting all the senses right there. You know, you're tasting, you're, looking around and seeing what's going on, the vibe you're hopefully with somebody that, you know, that you, that you vibe with and you're, you know, you're smelling the delicious food and you're listening to amazing music. And, you know, it's all of that together. It's like, that's what I'm trying to do is to provide this experience. Cause you know, let's hope that that's what you're doing outside of my restaurant, you know? Cool, so, man. Yeah. So when did you start Wu Chow? Two and a half years, you know, and after, um, we always kind of develop another thing. I'm, I, you know, being um, Chinese American, I've always wanted to um, share this part of my culture. I mean, food is so important to me. And one of the things I said before is the, the, a lot of times the first time that somebody gets to experience another culture is through their food. You know, like somebody who's never been to Mexico before have might have tried Mexican food being in, being in Texas. Somebody who's never flown to Shanghai that has a soup dumpling at um, Chow can sit there and go, I remember I had this before. And then Hopefully one day they'll make it over there and go, this is familiar, you know, and, or at least to represent the kind of beauty in it. And so, um, it, it was just one thing that always kind of weighed in my mind to say that we needed more of that cultural representative. There's a few places in town that have done it, but never kind of like this and not in that downtown hitting that kind of demographic that I was hitting. And I really wanted to provide, um, you know, organic and farm to table and adding in the aspect of uh, the, the music and, and the service and this whole vibe that's, that's going because I came from sushi bars, right? Running that, that really kind of took a cuisine and let, kept it elevated. And, and so for me, I was like, why can't Chinese food be this way? Also, there's no reason why you can't have this experience eating your eating fried rice and eating a soup dumpling that, that you can have having at a mame and, and a, and a, and a roll or, or something to eat, you know? So Wu Chow, my grandmother and my mother, I was raised by my grandmother, and my mother. And, um, you know, like I said, I grew up kind of in a, in a, in a single parent household and she fed me and she encouraged me my whole life. And they were super, super devastated that I got into the food and red beverage industry because they're so nervous. And, uh, you know, and I, I wanted to honor her. And so my grandmother's last name is Wu. And so Wu Chow, Chinese colloquially, was a Cao, which is like cook. And so Wu Chow, and then Chow, obviously, in English also means, so there's a lot of kind of depth to yeah. that, whatever. And then naming it Wu um, after my grandmother because I wanted her to get the credit. Uh, it was like one of the things, even my last name is Chin, but 
um, I was saying that if this became anything, uh, I wanted everyone to know that it was her. There's the, she, she deserves all the credit for it. The Wu family that, that, that raised me and, 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 um, fed me and, and took care of me this whole time is what, what did it? She, uh, the logo is even her handwriting. You know, I went there and pulled out the old feather pen and she wrote her name a hundred times until she found one that she liked. And we used her signature as, as our logo. It's just, just really as an homage to her and to give again, uh, to share this aspect of my culture that I so love to a city that has given me so much has welcomed me and felt like that. So that's, that's kind of the, the impetus for Jeff. That's a really cool backstory, man. Thanks, man. So obviously this was the hardest year for the restaurant industry mm -hmm. around the world. Yeah. Um, were you nervous? Did, were you ever close to having to shutting down any of your restaurants or anything like that? Oh, but it was terrifying. I mean, luckily again, my business partner is extremely good at, at operations, Sorry. you know, the, it's oh, me. that's you. Okay. Okay. Never no worries. We'll, we'll just leave it. We'll it's just leave it. The side but of the your business partner is extremely good at operations. Well, yeah, he, he knows how to, he knows how to, how, how to, to, to manage cash flow very, very well. There's never a doubt about that. And he, you know, he's a, he's a businessman through and through and he, he knows, you know, he like, that's not my strength. It really isn't. I'm an operations person on the ground level, but I don't know how to properly apply for PPP and, 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 and deal with, landlord leases and negotiations with that kind of stuff that was never my forte you know and so he you know handled it very very well and um and so from an operational perspective we have amazing operators in town luckily uh, sorry in, in in place we luckily i prior to this had you know already kind of positioned myself to be working on hope and native and and, and we negotiated because my GM over at Wu Chow, Rebecca, and 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 her AGM Sam over there are incredible. They've been with us since day zero. You know, Rebecca was the one that put up the mahjong wall that's in there that literally you know glued it all to the wall herself. You know, so she it's it's as as if I was there. She she was there from minute one expressing those views, and then you know Casey and the team and Curtis and Jeff um, were with us at Swiss Attic. You know since the minute Curtis and Jeff have taken the, the booze program over there. I mean, I go there and it blows my mind and we got all these rare marks of, of whiskey and everything like that because of the relationship. Because we got these, the beers that are very difficult to get because of the relationships that they've developed. So we have a very strong operational team. So that wasn't anything that I was concerned of. The main concern really was public sentiment. You know, can we weather this storm and for how long? And, um, you know, it is, it's been handled clumsily and it's been handled in a very bumpy kind of way but i think that um a good operator knows how to pivot and and hopefully you know we we don't have to keep doing that anymore i'll be happy if i ever never have to hear the word pivot again <laughs> ever <laughs> in my very life popular word oh my god it's so terrible but it's true it's to be able to sit here and say all right how can we how can we change this without fundamentally changing who we are and what we are about or Maybe we do, and, and we just find a new way to exist. I think any operator or business person worth this, worth their salt recognizes that. You know, the example I gave was, I mean, 15 years ago, I guess, in the beginning of like Atkins and all this gluten and, and the, all this carb, low carb, pre gluten free, it was this low carb fascination, right? I mean, imagine opening up like an Italian restaurant at that time that gave away free bread and eating pasta. Like all of a sudden, the entire civilization all of a sudden agreed that, hey, we're just going to stop eating bread and pasta. And you're like, oh my God. So what do we do? Like anybody who recognized this or saw the writing on the wall and realized that should have started making moves towards figuring out how to cater to these people that are wanting something different. Wu Chow opened day one, recognizing we're going to need vegan options, not as an apology, but to have dishes there because a lot of people want to practice a plant-based diet. Um, we went complete gluten-free using tamari instead of uh, a soy. And I told my chef and I, we worked on a recipe to say this, we need to use gluten-free soy, which does fundamentally taste different. Adjust your recipe to where it works with this soy so that we can say that 80% of our menu is gluten-free. Just knowing that that's the writing on the wall. We need to accommodate. This is what our, demographic our clientele our people our community wants so let's 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 give them what they want you know and so yeah. we'll People always say that the restaurant industry is one of the toughest industries and you see restaurants going in and out of business all the time 
Can you, is that true? And, and why, what makes it so hard? I think entrepreneurship is very difficult because what motivates people to do business tends to be, you know, uh, will come from different angles. And I think the restaurant business, the difficult part about it is hospitality and creativity don't necessarily run in this, live in the same brain as business savvy and efficiency and, you know, and those type of, uh, those type of thought processes. I mean, part of the reason why I have a consulting business at all is for that reason, a chef that understands and knows um, how to mix flavors together might not recognize how to do a proper food cost and be properly um, profitable. You know, being busy and profitable are two different things. Uh, it's one of those things that it's like um, a lot of these major restaurants, even uh, very busy restaurants, can still be run almost like a lemonade stand, the equivalent of at the end of the month, they just see how much money they have left after they spent what they needed to spend rather than looking at a way to replicate and to, to kind of make it down into some metrics, into some measurable growth, into some measurable um, you know, KPIs, right? Key performance indicators type things. And so I think that's what makes it difficult. I mean, I remember a chef we were trying at one of the restaurants I was consulting at before, the one of the first ones, but at the Pagi house, and he'd bring out this dish. It was this lobster carpaccio. And I looked at it and right away I was like, it was beautiful. The claws, this whole deshelled lobster. And I was like, chef, this is an entire lobster, you know? And I'm like, this dish is going to be $89. Like, can we sell this for $89? I'm like, is anybody going to buy this for $89? This is going to be crazy. It's going to be, it's going to, it's like, I get it. It's probably tasty, but there's a reason why, you know, lobster dishes only have four or five ounces of lobster in it. This is an expensive dish. I mean, I'm sure it's beautiful and delicious, but if we sold this, we would lose money on every one that we sold out or every one of these that had to throw away because it went bad, we would cancel out every every bit of the profit that we made from the other ones. And so that, that brain doesn't necessarily exist in a, in a creative, in a chef world. I mean, to, to bring it all the way back full circle to the artist is the same thing. Not every artist that knows how to paint knows how to sell their paintings. No, not every artist that understands how to, you know, color theory and understands these mediums of how to do, create these amazing works of art, understands how to incorporate themselves and pay proper taxes and, 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 and to do that kind of stuff. These, Matter of fact, not only not everyone, most of them, those things don't exist. It's a, it's kind of a right brain, left brain thing, even though, you know, whatever you want to believe, if that's a myth or not, it's the understanding that you have spent a lot of your life honing this aspect of your life and you didn't spend any of it talking about that. Yeah. You know? And that's where a good partnership can help. Right. So how did it's, you find your partner? We, he found me really, um, you know, he, he saw and he appreciated the way that I ran the restaurant that we were at. We became friends. Um, and he recognized this type of thing and said that, Hey, I think that you have the opportunity. You have the, you have the wherewithal, the skill set that I don't have, which is from the operation side where I have this side and recognize that again, a good partnership, I think is more supplementary and complementary rather than duplicating. You know, you, it's, it's great. It's awesome to hang out with somebody that is very much like yourself because you have great things to talk about. We can always talk about these type of things, but ultimately, you know, we have to find somebody that fills in the difficulties, the, 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 the challenges that you have, the struggles that you have. I said that on my way out the door to, you know, work on Wu Chao, my uh, manager that was taking over my general uh, manager role. I said, Hey, look, it's going to be very, you know, enticing for you to hire someone like you. I said, but you have to realize you have to hire someone like me because I'm the one that's leaving. I hired you because you like the things that I hate. So now you need to hire <laughs> somebody that likes things that you hate and get that person in here rather than someone that you resonate with that you like, you know? And I'm yeah. like, well, you should like them a little, but at the end of the day, it's like, does you no good to hire a duplicate of yourself? Because then both of y'all are just going to fall on your face when you, when you guys don't realize what in the world you need. Hey everyone, this is your host, Justin. I just wanted to thank everyone for listening and give those that are new to the podcast a reminder to please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcast player. If you're on YouTube, Please like the video, share it with a friend. That helps us out. Thank you. For sure. So what's the story with Native Hostel? Native Hostel, um, I, I became connected with them through um, just being in the community. Um, it was from a consulting side. And um, my business partner, Antonio, with Hope, is the, one of the three original partners for Native and brought me in on an operational side um, to 
just give them an audit to see how they're doing. And they're a bar, correct? I, well, at the time it was a full hostel. It was oh. had rooms and everything, you know. So, okay. um, and a bar and an event space. I mean, they were multifaceted. It was this mecca for for creativity, and it very meshed very well with my idea. We love the place and it's beautifully designed. And, and, uh, but the three partners out of the three of them, two of them are developers, you know, they're both GCs and then one is a real estate person, you know, Michael Dixon and Antonio are both incredible builders. They've built some of the best places in Austin, um, beautiful design places. And then Will, who's an, you know, a wonderful real estate person that, that understands that game very, very well, but they didn't have any operators on their, their, their team. So, you know, I told them, I'm like, look, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't have to be me. I said, but realistically, you can't have no coach that's played the game. You know, that's not a successful team. You sit there and coach a, coach a basketball team, and then you have nobody that's ever played the game. Everyone just kind of knows about it in theory. Um, and so we were, they were already looking to expand, talking about building out into native Denver and stuff like that. And so, you know, we, we hashed out our um, kind of conversation and decided that we should partner up together because we need some, we need that fourth leg to kind of balance out the, balance out the equation to have an operation side, a development side and a finance and real estate side. And so it's again, the same thing is to let's not try to find everybody who we all kind of get along and not get along with that. We all are the exact same person. We should find people that fill in all the necessary gaps in our skill set, so that we can build a team that can properly execute a business. So, you know, that one actually got hit very hard because I don't know if you've ever stayed in a hostel. It's a, Typically, the difference between a hostel and a hotel is a hostel is by the bed, hotels by the room. Historically speaking, uh, everywhere else in the world, hostel was a financial decision. It was a cheaper way because you're not renting an entire room. It's a shared space, communal bathrooms, that kind of stuff. So you can go and backpack through Europe and stay in a hostel for $15 a bed. Um, we saw, they saw a rise of wanting to capture the culture of that type of person that likes that communal entertainment maybe you're traveling alone and you don't know anybody in the city but guess what now you have some roommates that you can meet and if you're that type of person that you enjoy that take a hostel find a hostel then all of a sudden you wake up and you have a roommate and you're like hey where are you going for lunch today i don't know we're all traveling different why don't you come with us we're gonna go to the river you want to come you know so and so forth so we created this very this community and and but still gave it all the creature comforts that a hotel has you know private bathrooms instead of communal, a bar, a nice bar that has parties and DJs and so on and so forth that you can go and enjoy yourself and have you know, a coffee shop and an event space that created, you know, had, had dope concerts or whatever it is, uh, you know, in our community where all the art is showcased and people can kind of become a part of this creative. Um, so then when COVID hit, it was like all of a sudden the idea of sleeping in the same room with strangers completely went by the, not only by the wayside, it was became illegal and very, very, bad idea yeah. and so we've since um kind of pivoted into a commercial workspace so now each of these rooms have now become individual businesses which has been a very cool very cool difference you know um we have a chiropractor and we have a, a chocolatier and we have a uh you know a photo studio and you know these small businesses that are using us as a kind of a workspace that then can use the amenities of the hotel almost like as uh, a main office, you know, to go grab a coffee and have meetings there or, you know, so on and so forth. Um, you know, when we're what Austin offices out of there and it's just a central location for them. And it's great because when they have meetings, they just go out and grab a table at the coffee shop and have a meeting and then go right back to their office. It's a very cool idea. And I think that we're going to probably take that with us. Hopefully when we, when we develop Denver is to say, well, we're going to still add in the rooms and everything, that aspect, once people start to travel again and do that. But I think this idea of a multifamily, multi-use um, business kind of retail floor has been really, really fun to watch develop. You know, like we're looking for a barber or a salon or a, a hairstylist or a, a nail a esthetician or a, you know, a, a, a nail salon that wants to move into one of these rooms so that Again, so it's a one-stop shop. Go get you a tattoo over there, and somebody can go get adjusted by the chiropractor. Go somebody go shopping for for chocolate, and 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 a group of kids can a group of people can uh, be getting their nails done, and then everyone can come out and grab a drink afterwards. It's like this kind of awesome little bazaar, this kind of community. Nice, yeah. So we're almost out of time. I got a few more questions for you. Sure. I hope you're still good on time. But of course, um, yeah. 
Uh, where can people maybe catch you around town? What kind of things do you like to do in Austin? I mean, obviously they might see you so static with Chow, yeah. et cetera, but anything else? Man, I, at this moment, I'm really big on supporting our, the people that are trying to do their best. You know, I think that, um, I love trying out new restaurants. Um, you know, I, um, watching what this community did during the last couple, um, you know, the last couple disasters, as it were, uh, is simultaneously very, very inspiring and wonderful while also, you know, I, I would consider kind of monumentally stupid that we had to do that. And so I think that the other end of that equation is to kind of pay it back to them because, you know, places like Loco de Oro, Comodoro Villa, and, you know, these, you know, these restaurants that have, you know, Chalantro and So's Delivery and So's, you know, these guys are, they, they so selflessly gave back to the community so quick and so, you know, automatically that now it's our turn to, to go back and support. I mean, I just saw an, uh, an ad that posted that Loco de Oro and um, Olame, you know, Michael uh, over there are reopening finally. I mean, I, and I was like, I posted it and told my friends, I'm like, look, man, if they're not booked up every weekend from now until 2023, like I'm going to be very disappointed in Austin because while they were closed, while they were trying to figure out ways to kind of keep their business alive, they gave. So now it's our chance to go support them. And unfortunately people have short memories. Remember this. We need to remember that, you know, um, I, with Austin mutual aid with hopefully with, you know, with good work, Austin and a couple other, the people. Um, I'm kind of creating this, I've, you know, affectionately named it kind of this Austin disaster, Austin disaster coalition, this kind of idea of a kind of decentralized, you know, coalition of business, of groups that can try to prepare for this to not happen again. Um, we all now I've been here long enough to have seen this happen five or six times already with hurricanes fires or you know any different reasons that we do it but we all seem to start from ground zero every single time we start from zero again just reset and then somebody has to step up good work austin is the first group that i've seen that has maintained this kind of throughout and so when it happened again that's how they were able to respond so quickly because they had just kind of done this whole group and this organization the the march the may before you know the, the year before because of COVID. So they maintain this, this group. And so the idea of us kind of all sitting at this round table of being able to um, put the right people to flip this bat signal on and tell everybody to kind of mobilize, um, I think has been very weighing very heavily on my heart to try to work on, on top of hope. I'll be there. Once hope opens, I'll be there a lot. So I'm, I'm sure, you know, come see me there, but this has been something that's very, very important to me because I don't want to do this again. You know, I don't want to have to do that again. I don't want to have to, um, find a way. It's like, I don't mind. I don't want, I, I, I like helping and I think we all need to help. And I know that this isn't the, isn't the last disaster. And I know that we can't prepare for everything, but it shouldn't be, we shouldn't have to go uphill and backwards to do it. Like we should at least just to, to kind of put the rails down and let it, let it go. You know, I mean, perfect examples like the breweries that, that recognize, and I can't, you know, I wish I need to do some research because people asked me this a couple of times, but, uh, one of the breweries, um, one of the first ones that emptied out their tanks to boil water, to allow people to come by and get boiled water. Well, yeah, what a brilliant idea. I didn't even think about that. I didn't realize that. But guess what? Now, when we don't need it, we should sign agreements with these breweries and say, look, I'm going to put some funding aside. I'm going to fundraise now to have this kind of sitting there waiting for a rainy day that when this happens, all I have to do is call you and you know that your business is going to be taken care of because this funding is going to take care of you. You can empty out your, 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 your beer tanks start bottling water instead of beer. And then you're going to be made whole from, from our, from our funding to make sure that you can do this without necessarily sacrificing yourself. Just boom. We that's expected of you. You know that that's going to happen. So let's get ready for it. I think it's a great idea. I mean, yeah, you can, 
we might as well rely on ourselves and not just totally on the government, right? I mean, there's there's so many yes. businesses and people in town. It's like having that extra layer of security. I mean, also we can respond faster. We respond faster. To truth be told, is it's just it's just going to be faster. I'm not, you know, this is a totally different podcast for me to go rant and rave about, you know, rant about, you know, what what the government can or can't do. Um, at this point, again, it's one of those things where we have the tendency to say, um, surely somebody's going to do this, and, and and the answer is no. It's it's it was us. It is us. It's still us. So. Let's just do it. It's just, you know, like it's, again, it, it was somebody that I had hoped that somebody would take up the mantle and, and do it. And some of, some people have, but we're all these little individual islands. And I think that there's an opportunity for us to put that together in a way. I mean, the water initiative that we did was this miraculous, com, com, you know, this coming together of resources because of that these are all people that I knew and we connected everybody. You know, it was a, uh, a buddy of mine, MT who said that, look, I saw that you were doing something. I don't know exactly how I can help, but I have some funds that I can dedicate to helping you out. I had uh, a water distribution, a water company that was, you know, Richard rainwater with Taylor and, and, um, Katie that reached out to me and says, Hey, you're the guy, what can we do? What, sh- what can we do to help? And, and they were like, well, we have this water. Can we, you know, figure out how we can get it to you? And then I was like, well, I need to find somebody who has a distribution network. And Oh, let me call my, my boys, uh, Julian and Chong over at Minamoto and they have a warehouse. I said, can we borrow your warehouse and your forklifts? And, and they they jumped at it and said, boom, no problem. And then reached out to our community to get delivery drivers and, um, you know, easy tiger answered the call and got us a whole fleet of trucks of their trucks to go deliver water to people. And so, you know, within, within 24 hours of happening, my, my business partner and one of my best friends, Paul with, uh, you know, 12 rivers, a real estate guy. And I'm a restaurant guy. We got our first round with music water, like 11,000 bottles that got through, you know, because, you know, Paul just took it upon our, you know, took it upon himself to shoulder that burden, got those first 11,000 bottles out in the middle of the cold. This was literally the day after the boil notice. And then within the next 24 hours with all, with connecting with Minamoto and with these other, with Richards and these people, um, we were able to get 150,000 bottles of water in, in, in 48 hours, you know, and to the hospitals, um, you know, days before FEMA got to them, you know? And so why don't we just put these people in place and say that, Hey, when this happens again, be ready for us. And then I can make sure that we're properly funded. We can make sure that everyone knows the kind of operating procedure that has happened. This is how it's going to go. This is going to go to Austin mutual aid because they know how to distribute. This is going to go to Austin ease water because they know how to get water to people. This is going to go to these people because the, the food bank needs, knows how to give food to people or whatever it works. Or these are the restaurants that are all going to be serving food. So world central kitchen and good work. Austin can make sure that we, these restaurants are going to get paid for the, you know, to take care of these meals for these people that are going hungry. All of this stuff can be planned because it's coming again. We're going to get another hurricane anytime soon. I mean, shit, what does it say? Like the plague of locusts is probably going to be coming. I mean, it's the year of the hundred year cicada or whatever like that's coming, right? I mean, it's not a joke. It's really going to happen. Who knows? You know, who knows what's going to happen? So why don't we prepare for it? And, um, and again, as much as I had assumed or hoped that I think I think I sh- there's probably a, a dozen or a hundred people in the city that all shared my same sentiment going, surely somebody's going to do it. And then, well, maybe not. So, you know, get at me if you want to be, you know, if you want to help and you want to be a part of it, then let's, let's, let's just do it ourselves. Yeah. You know, let's just go from there. So it's at CK chin on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. But everywhere. It's, but it's, I'll put it in the show notes. Cause it's not <laughs> yeah, spelled S- how you S- think. S- e- K- I, I, again, we talk about first adopter as far as technology goes. I started when a two letter username was not allowed so i just spelt out ck instead of c-e-k-y <laughs> you're a little too early that was too early yeah it was i was bummed out that you know my first email address they're like you cannot use you have to use at least three letters and i was like what <laughs> so you know but well hey thank you so much for coming in i really oh, enjoyed my, this my pleasure, man i really um i really thank you for again uh, you know uh, for those of you who don't know i mean justin reached out via instagram kind of right in the middle of when we were still doing relief efforts. And so I, mean, I appreciate the patience and, and come in and still wanting to talk about this, you know, after everything is kind of calmed down. So it's, it's good. And, and I'm an honor to, to talk about it. So anytime. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.